I came from 10, 10 kids in the family and didn't have a whole lot. And I came home one night and my dad said, you need to start spending more time around the house. And I asked him why. And he said, well, these college coaches are calling all the time. And back then, of course, you didn't have cell phones. You had the dial up phone and the 15, 20 foot long cord. Um, and he said, I'm just getting tired of answering the phone all the time. He goes, like tonight, he goes, there was like four or five calls tonight. And, you know, and I asked him who, and he rattled off a handful. And he mentioned, he said, there was a, somebody from Florida. And I thought he meant the Florida Gators. And I said, the Gators? He goes, no, not the Gators. He said, I know who they are. And I said, Miami? And he said, no. And I, he and I couldn't think of who else it would have been. And finally, I said, I think there's a Florida State. A lot of people don't believe that story, but that's true. I, I had no idea. Florida State, who they were, what their nickname was, what their color was, what, what town were they in. You look at that and you think there's no way that that, that program has come that far, but it, but that's that's true. That's that's reality. One of my favorite stories, when Bear came to the, to the house where I grew up in, in Sarasota, Florida, um, he walked in with his entourage and, of course, had his hound's tooth hat on, and my mother was standing in the kitchen facing the door that he walked in, and he took his hat off and went to flip it on the back of the couch, and it hit the back of the couch and landed behind the couch on the floor. And my mother freaked out, screaming, pick it up, pick it up. Don't let that sit on the dirty floors. The only thing I remember about what Bear had to say that whole visit was right after my mother said that in his uh, deep baritone voice or whatever, he, he says, oh, just leave it lay. And that's all I remember. I don't remember him saying anything else that I was going to be the greatest, whatever, or I'm going to, I don't remember anything. It was like, almost like Moses dropping the tablets as far as my mother was concerned. Welcome to Hidden Yardage. I'm your host, Joe Moore. This podcast is a journey back to the 1980 college football season through the memories of those that played, coached, and covered it. New episodes, released each week, will carry listeners through that season one week at a time. For more information, please visit the website at www.hiddenyardagepodcast.com. If this is your first time listening, you may want to go back and start with episode one. This is Episode 6, On the Warpath. The Houston Cougars' 1980 season had not gotten off to a great start. The team was 11-1 in 1979 and won a second straight conference championship and started this season ranked in the top 10. The back-to-back season-opening losses dropped them out of the rankings entirely, and a third loss to Baylor had them reeling at 1-3. So when longtime head coach Bill Yeoman was given the option to move his scheduled home game against Texas A&M to nearby Rice Stadium, he declined. He wasn't going to give up any possible advantage. The offer was made because the Houston Astrodome, where the school played its home games, was set to host Game 4 of the 1980 National League Championship Series between the Astros and the Phillies the same afternoon as the Aggies and the Cougars football game. Instead of moving the game to a different day or a different venue, Yeoman elected to kick off after the baseball game ended. The first pitch of the NLCS was at 3.15, but it would take nearly four hours before Pete Rose scored the game-winning run in the 10th inning for the Phillies. Around 7.30, the grounds crew started to get the field ready for football. It had to cover the warning track with turf, excavate the pitcher's mound, board up the dugouts, and reline the field with chalk. The transformation took another four hours, and it wasn't until after 11.30 p.m. that Houston and Texas A&M could start their game. The contest wore on into the wee hours of the morning. Many of the more than 35,000 fans that attended had brought pillows with them, and a local sports publicist served a champagne breakfast at halftime for the exhausted sports writers that had been there all day to cover the unconventional doubleheader. At 2.43 in the morning on Sunday, The final gun sounded, 
and the Cougars had beaten the Aggies 17-7, even though it took them two days to do it. The worst part of all was that the Phillies' victory forced a Game 5 Sunday evening, and the grounds crew would have to work through the morning to get the field ready for baseball again. That wasn't the only game of note in the Lone Star State that day. Texas and Oklahoma had renewed their hostilities in Dallas, albeit at the much more traditional time of 11.50 in the morning. The two schools combined for 14 turnovers, and Texas remained unbeaten while handing Oklahoma its second loss of the year. In Waco, the Baylor Bears kept pace with the Longhorns and preserved their perfect season by erasing a 21-point deficit against SMU. Texas and Baylor were just two of the 11 teams that entered Week 6 undefeated, and it's probably helpful to recap how we got to this point in the season. In the SEC, Alabama is 4-0 and ranked number one with a devastating ground attack. The Tide have one of the country's easiest schedules and will not play the other unbeaten team in the conference, Georgia. The Bulldogs have climbed into the top 10 after four straight wins to start the season, and their star freshman Herschel Walker is proving to be even better than advertised. In the ACC, North Carolina is still undefeated, and its defense, led by Lawrence Taylor, hasn't allowed a touchdown all year. The Tar Heels don't figure to be tested before their November 1st game in Norman against Oklahoma. The Pac-10 declared half of its teams ineligible for the conference championship or a postseason bowl game, but two of them, USC and UCLA, are undefeated and ranked in the top six, threatening to muddy the national title picture. The Big Ten's Ohio State started the year ranked number one, but like every other team in the conference, has at least one loss. The Big Eight has only Iowa State with a perfect record, though Nebraska's narrow loss to Florida State hasn't completely snuffed out its chances at number one. The 11th-ranked Seminoles are one of four contending independent teams joining unbeaten Miami, number 7 Notre Dame, and number 4 Pitt. And it just so happens that in Week 6, the Pitt Panthers and Florida State Seminoles will do battle in Tallahassee on Saturday night. Chuck Bonasort grew up in Pittsburgh and won a national championship in 1976 playing for the Panthers. Now, in 1980, he and his mother run the Cashmar, a restaurant near campus that was always full of pit players and fans. One of the Panthers' biggest stars, Hugh Green, would often eat there and even called Mrs. Bonasort his second mom. Chuck's younger brother would love to be playing football with Hugh Green, but when he finished his senior year of high school, the Panthers didn't offer him a scholarship. Nobody did. That's when Francis Joseph Bonasort, nicknamed Monk, took an unlikely path to an All-American career in Tallahassee. He started playing semi-pro football in Sandlot Leagues. A friend contacted the Seminoles defensive coordinator Jack Stanton, also a Pennsylvania native, to let him know about Monk, and Stanton encouraged him to try and walk onto the team in 1977. Monk made the team, and before the first kickoff that season, he had earned a scholarship. He led the team in interceptions as a junior in 1979, and returned to Pittsburgh during the offseason to work at the Casmar, while conditioning himself for the upcoming season and engaging in plenty of good-natured trash talk with players on the Pitt team. It was after some of these trash-talking sessions that Monk was working out inside Pitt Stadium, and he found himself being approached by Panthers head coach Jackie Sherrill. A newspaper reporter had published some of Monk's comments about Pitt, who was garnering a lot of preseason hype and would face the Seminoles during the 1980 season. Sherrill had seen the article and said to Monk, "'Don't let your mouth write a check that your ass can't cash.'" On October 11, 1980, at 7 o'clock p.m., payment was due. The Seminole Indian is at midfield and has spiked his lance that is burning as the Florida State people release the balloons that float high in the air. And they're thinking major bowl, and they're thinking second straight upset in as many weeks. The toss to the coin has already taken place, and to the delight of the capacity crowd here, Florida State has won and will receive. Sports Illustrated placed Pittsburgh star defensive end Hugh Green on the cover of its 1980 college preview magazine with an 80-pound female panther named Orpheus. Green remembered that during the photo shoot, the jungle cat tore his shirt in two places and wouldn't stop licking his ear. The caption on the photo said, The baddest cat in the game. And you could add Orpheus to the list of creatures that had tried unsuccessfully to unseat Green from his perch. He signed with Pittsburgh out of Natchez, Mississippi, 
and had built one of the most dominant careers in college football history. Incredibly fast, he could chase down ball carriers from sideline to sideline, and he always arrived with violently bad intentions. On a team of stars, he shone brightest, and his Panthers defense was dominant through the first four games of the 1980 season. The team was undefeated, ranked fourth, and Green's improbable Heisman campaign was alive and well. Right around the time of the Florida State game, the University of Pittsburgh had printed out posters to announce Green's candidacy for the prestigious award. A defensive player had never won the Heisman before, and the promotional piece contained a message to would-be voters that might shy away from breaking with that tradition. Quote, The conclusion is simple. If logic be your guide and justice your conscience, why not a defensive player if he so merits for the Heisman Trophy in 1980? The matchup with the Seminoles would be the toughest test of the year for Pitt. The Panthers had not yet played a ranked team, and the largest crowd in Tallahassee history promised to add to the challenge of a nighttime road game against the number 11 team in the country. The late kickoff meant that head coach Jackie Sherrill could give his Panthers team more time to relax at the hotel with family before the game. It's a decision that Sherrill still regrets making. Yeah, we had that one game that I keep kicking myself on, and that was the Florida State game. And, you know, the biggest mistake I made, because we had quite a few kids from the South who stayed that it was a night game. So I allowed the players to visit with their families. Well, you know, I I thought it would be their mom and dads and brother and sisters, and but it was – you know, their aunts, uncles, cousins, and some of the players had 10 or 12 people there. Uh, so, you know, I took, that was my fault, that I took the focus off our team to get ready for the game, and the focus was spending time with their families. So, uh, you know, at the end of the game, or towards the, certainly the end of third quarter, fourth quarter, if we had gone another quarter, we may have pulled that game out. But, you know, we we lost it, and there was a reason that we did lose it. If the leisurely pregame routine had dulled the Panthers' edge, it wasn't clear on the first play of the game. The Seminoles called a pass play, confident in the defense it expected Pittsburgh to play. They were wrong. Rick Stock still realized the miscalculation as Hugh Green was barreling in on him after a naked bootleg and slung him down to the turf at the one-yard line. The Seminoles would go three and out, and Pittsburgh would take over at midfield. As Florida State's defense looked to stem the Panthers' momentum, it would have to do so without the hero of the Nebraska game, Paul Porowski. The senior linebacker was in surgery just 24 hours after learning he had won several National Player of the Week honors for his clutch sack to end the game in Lincoln. He had awoken early on Wednesday morning with pain in his side, and after a few tests and visits with doctors, He was on the operating table to have his appendix taken out. So determined to play in the pit game was Porowski that he got out of his hospital bed and started doing jumping jacks to prove that he wasn't too hurt to suit up. But the team wouldn't let him dress for the game, and he'd be forced to watch from the sidelines, sitting on the bench wearing a cowboy hat and chewing tobacco. The next week, he sneaked onto the practice field and begged his coaches for a chance to go into the game against Boston College, even if just for one play. They let him, and Porowski trotted back to the bench, smiling. What he didn't tell his coaches is that he had made a bet with several teammates that he would only miss one game for having the appendectomy, and his appearance, albeit brief, against the Eagles, had won him a steak and a case of beer. Ron Simmons was suited up to play against Pittsburgh, but he had re-injured his ankle on the artificial turf against Nebraska and had been limited throughout the week in practice. The explosive Panthers offense showed no mercy on the shorthanded Seminoles, and it struck Pater on just its second play of the game. Flower goes wide to the right. Moreno goes back to throw. As the time goes deep toward the end zone where it is caught. Touchdown. And that is number 32, Dwight Collins, the freshman flanker who caught two touchdown passes last week against the University of Maryland. And Moreno was right on target, a 39-yard touchdown pass. And Bobby Bowden said, you know they're going to hit the big one. Dan Marino's pass was dropped perfectly between two Seminole defenders for an early 7-0 lead. When the next two Florida State drives went nowhere, it seemed that back-to-back-to-back games against undefeated ranked teams had caught up with the Knolls. Then, 
a pit fumble changed everything and forecasted a night of mistakes for the Panthers. The Seminoles recovered, and kicker Bill Capice picked up right where he had left off the week before by booting a 24-yard field goal to make the score 7-3. Pitt threatened on its next drive, but fumbled again to give it back to Florida State. After the Panther defense forced another three and out, their returner dropped the punt to once again set up the Seminoles with great field position. Rick Stockstill stood tall against heavy pressure and found Horace Johnston in the back of the end zone for a 10-7 lead. Now it was Florida State's defense that was riding a wave of momentum. It forced the Panthers to punt from their own end zone, and another stock still pass made it 17-7 for the home team. Bill Capice would add two more field goals in a frantic last minute that included another Marino turnover, and Florida State had scored 23 points in two quarters against a pit defense that had allowed only a total of 20 points in four games. The offensive outburst was shocking, but perhaps even more notable was the play of the Florida State special teams. Capice was 3-for-3 three three on field goal attempts, including a 50-yarder to end the half, and punter Ron Stark had punts of 51, 67, and 60 yards on his way to earning Southeastern Defensive Player of the Week honors. It had been an opportunistic first half for Florida State, and the Panthers, winners of 14 straight games, were trailing for the first time all season. There was still a half of football to be played, and Marino would lead his team to a third-quarter rally that would once again turn the tide in this heavyweight fight. And speaking of tide, Pitt wasn't the only top-five team struggling on the road this Saturday. Paul Bear Bryant and his Alabama football team were in New York City to play Rutgers in the Meadowlands. For his players, the shock of the skyscrapers and commotion of the city that never sleeps was just as eye-popping as it was when their legendary coach first witnessed it as a player in 1933. Many of his players grew up in small towns throughout the southeast before coming to play football for the Alabama Crimson Tide in Tuscaloosa, just as Bryant had done. Bryant found his way to the University of Alabama from his hometown of Morrow Bottom, Arkansas, where he was born in 1913. It's a small creekside settlement that is likely only to be included on maps today because he was born there. Summarizing Brian's life and his impact across an entire region of the United States is a monumental undertaking, so I'll stick to just a few entertaining anecdotes. There are two versions of the story about how he got the nickname Bear. The first says that Brian and his friends headed over to the Lyric Theater, which featured a bonus act on its small stage. It was a dollar-a-minute bear wrestling match, but the man scheduled to take on the animal didn't show up. Bryant was encouraged by his friends and the opportunity to impress a pretty red-haired girl who worked at the theater to fill in. In another accounting, a traveling carnival came to town and offered anybody a dollar a minute to wrestle a muzzled bear. Bryant was dared to take the offer and did, and by the time the match started at 8 p.m. that night, the auditorium was packed. The 14-year-old Bryant charged the animal and held him on the floor, content to hold on for dear life and collect as much money as he could. The bear squirmed free and Bryant tried his tactic again. It worked momentarily until the bear's muzzle fell off. Bryant's sister in the audience screamed and he felt a burning sensation on his ear and warm blood running down his neck. He jumped off the stage and into the front row to escape. He lasted at least two minutes and so had earned a decent wage, but the owner and the bear skipped town. Bryant was left with nothing but a few scars and a nickname that would last a lifetime. Bear Bryant played at Alabama under head coach Wallace Wade. He won a national championship in 1934 and played with a broken leg against Tennessee in 1935. As a senior, he played USC in the Rose Bowl and was asked to do a screen test by Paramount Pictures. He was offered a contract, but his wife didn't want to move out west, so he had to turn it down, opting instead for a life in coaching. The day after the attack on Pearl Harbor, he turned down a chance to be the head coach at Arkansas and volunteered to join the Navy. After his service, he coached at Maryland, Kentucky, and Texas A&M before Alabama famously came calling. His first year as head coach of the Crimson Tide was 1958, and by 1961, he had won his first national championship for his alma mater. Over his 24-year tenure, he would reinvent himself time and time again, and become the winningest coach in college football history. In 1978, Alabama beat Penn State in one of the most highly regarded championship games ever. 
Afterwards, Bryant, by now one of the most famous personalities in American sports, was seen celebrating while wearing a new t-shirt with a tear in it. When others pointed out that his shirt had a hole in it, Bryant said, Yeah, I know. I always tear a small hole in my t-shirts, so I'll never forget where I came from. Sometime in the mid-1970s, Bryant was having lunch at New York Jets owner Sonny Werblin's home in Florida when he was shown an architect's drawing of the new Meadowlands Stadium. Werblin remarked that he couldn't wait to see Alabama play Rutgers there, and Bryant scoffed, telling Werblin that schedules were made years in advance. Werblin responded that nobody would be stupid enough to turn down a game in front of 78,000 fans at $10 a head. And so, Alabama dropped two games against Miami to make room on its schedule for the match with Rutgers, the Tide's first game in the East since 1960. The Scarlet Knights were unbeaten, but figured to offer little resistance against Alabama. The Tide led the nation in points and rushing yards, and Rutgers, though statistically ranked as one of the toughest defenders of the run, had played Cincinnati, Temple, Princeton, and Cornell. Bryant had been excited to bring his team north so it could both see the Big Apple and be seen by New York and its media, and Rutgers planned to take full advantage of the big stage in the David vs. Goliath moment. The two teams exchanged punts to begin the game, and then the Knights started to move the ball against the number one team in the country. Towards the end of the first quarter, Rutgers got on the scoreboard first. Ball be placed down about the uh, 34-yard line. There's the kick. It's up. It's long enough. And it is good. First play. And Rutgers jumps ahead of Alabama by the score of 3 to nothing. It was the first time all season that anybody had scored on Alabama in the first quarter and the Tide answered with a field goal of its own to tie the game at three. Rutgers was playing inspired football and making Alabama earn every inch. Eventually, the visitors broke through with a touchdown before halftime, but midway through the third quarter, Alabama only led 10-6. With his running game held in check by the Scarlet Knights, Bryant called back-to-back pass plays that covered 79 yards and proved to be the difference in the game. Rutgers would score again to cut the lead to 17-13, to but a final drive would end in a sack, and Alabama would escape with its number one ranking and a 26-game winning streak still intact. After the game, Bryant would say, We didn't beat anyone today. We didn't beat Rutgers, that's for sure. I'd say they'd beat us, but we won the game. Rutgers could not sustain the momentum, lost to William and Mary the next week before finishing 7-4. and four. It would have only four winning seasons in the next 24 years. UCLA had made headlines the previous week by going into the horseshoe and shutting out unbeaten and second-ranked Ohio State. Now the fifth-ranked Bruins were set to take on 16th-ranked Stanford. During the offseason, when UCLA head coach Terry Donahue was looking for an offensive assistant, he decided to reach out to the highest authority. Homer Smith had played football at Princeton before earning an MBA from Stanford while coaching the freshman football team. He served as head coach at Army during the tumultuous years following the Vietnam War. After five years, he was fired from West Point and enrolled at the Harvard Divinity School. He was pursuing a master's degree in theological studies when Donahue came calling to ask Smith to take over running the offense. That would free him up to do more of his head coaching responsibilities. The impact was immediate. UCLA was now scoring over 30 points per game after averaging just 23 the year before but this week's game would come down to how well the Bruins could stop sophomore quarterback John Elway, and they'd have to do it without an injured Kenny Easley. UCLA started the game by scoring an early touchdown and was looking for more when Freeman McNeil fumbled to set up the Cardinals' tying score. Stanford would score again to make it 14-7, then turn another Bruins fumble into a third touchdown and a 21-7 lead at halftime. McNeil had gained only 28 yards rushing for UCLA in the first two quarters, but a confusing zone defense slowed down Elway and the Cardinals, and McNeil took over. At halftime, UCLA's running backs coach had told his star senior that the game was in his hands, but he'd have to start running north and south. McNeil took the advice to heart and galloped for 220 yards and four touchdowns in the second half as the Bruins pulled away for the victory 35-21. It was during one of McNeil's long runs that legendary UCLA basketball coach John Wooden almost lost his $5,000 ring. It was a ring adorned with 10 diamonds, 
one for each of the championships he won at the school, given to him by the university upon his retirement. Watching the game from the press box, Wooden tossed a roll of streamer paper to celebrate McNeil's second-half outburst, and the ring came off with it. It struck an 18-year-old in the back, who picked it up and turned around to see Coach Wooden waving, so he tossed it back to him. An usher later brought the young man up to Coach Wooden so he could thank him in person. The Bruins had jumped six spots last week after two top-five teams lost, and they stood to gain more ground if number 4 Pitt couldn't find its way out of a 16-point hole in Tallahassee. Marino and the Panthers got the ball first to start the second half and wasted no time finding the end zone, covering 80 yards in just 1 minute and 51 seconds. They added the two-point conversion to cut the lead to 23-15. to Two more Bill Capice field goals to tie a school record with five in one game pushed the advantage back to 14 before another pit touchdown at the end of the quarter made it 29-22 to with 15 minutes left to go. Pitt's defense held to give the offense the ball with the chance to tie or take the lead. Marino moved the team out past the 35-yard line, but a fumbled handoff, the fifth turnover of the night for Pitt, gave it back to the Seminoles. Stockstill continued to frustrate one of the most talented defenses in the country with his third touchdown pass to make the score 36-22. All night long, Florida State had employed a strategy of calling plays that could be run to the left or the right. Stockstill would approach the line of scrimmage, and based on what look Pitt's defense presented, would call out the direction of the play. After the game, Bowden would say that his team could not have won without that plan. Marino would try and rally his team once again, but with six minutes to go in the game, his pass was intercepted by Monk Bonasort to slam the door shut on the comeback attempt. For Bonasort, it was sweet revenge against the school that didn't want him and the coach that warned him to be careful of what he said. On this night, he could say that his Seminoles had just knocked off their second straight top five opponent and had proved themselves a legitimate title contender. Bonasort would eventually be inducted into the Florida State Hall of Fame and enjoy a long career working for the university. In November of 2016, just before his beloved Seminoles were to take on the University of Florida, he succumbed to brain cancer at the age of 59. Bonasort who was 4-0 as a player against the University of Florida, had some of his ashes spread on the tip of Chief Osceola's spear as he threw it into the turf at the 50-yard line before the game against the Gators. With the 42-yard line painted black in memory of their deceased legend, the Seminoles won 31-13. Back in 1980, it was Pittsburgh that was mourning the loss of its undefeated season as it limped back to campus to regroup. Florida State had survived the toughest part of its schedule. It had the resume to claim a national championship, but with several undefeated teams still in front of it, it was going to need some help. Blood Week was coming. Next week on Hidden Yardage, the story of the 1980 college football season. The Pitt Panthers had lost their undefeated season in Tallahassee. Now they would lose their quarterback as they tried to survive the backyard brawl against West Virginia. Passing offenses take center stage, as Purdue and Illinois set the Big Ten passing record twice in the same game, and Jim McMahon's BYU Cougars hang 70 in a home game against Utah State. Plus, can Southern Cal's undefeated season survive a test by the Oregon Ducks? The Hidden Yardage podcast is researched, written, narrated, and produced by me, Joe Moore. If you enjoyed the episode, please rate and review wherever you listen to podcasts. For a list of everybody that appeared in this episode and special acknowledgments, please visit the website at www.hiddenyardagepodcast.com. There you'll find a full transcript of every show, as well as schedules, stats, and standings from the 1980 season. Please email your questions and comments to me at joe at hiddenyardagepodcast.com. This podcast is made possible through Moonlight Magic Productions. Thank you for listening.